the Cannabis Business Coach. Hi, Mike Z here, author of the Cannabis Business Book, and you're listening to the Cannabis Business Coach Podcast, where I chat with and coach the highest performing entrepreneurs in the cannabis industry. Hi, Mike Z is, hi, Mike Z is, hi, Mike Z is, the Cannabis Business Coach. Hi, Mike Z here, and on today's episode of the Cannabis Business Coach Podcast, I'm joined by Mike McDonald, the CEO and president of Ammonite, like the hippie crystal, (laughs) but it's not a hippie crystal. It's a cannabis technology company that's not only bringing a new product to market, but building a new category, and we'll talk about that today, but first, I want to welcome you, Mike, and if you don't mind, can you tell the folks at home a little more about yourself and your background? Yeah, sure. Hey, Mike, Mike Z. I like that. They, uh, they refer to me as Mike McD. So um, I like it. Uh, so thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, I mean, my background, not unlike a lot of folks in the cannabis industry, is really eclectic, right? I mean, I come from a very sort of entrepreneurial background. Um, I come from more of an operations background as opposed to like a financial engineering side. So as we all know in this industry, it was really built by folks in the operations side. I mean, cultivation to processing, retail and so forth. Um, but then there's also been a lot of money that's been brought into the space to really help it grow. So I'm an operations guy. My background is, you know, when I went to college, uh, left college, I went to Taiwan and I studied Mandarin Chinese and that got me into the bicycle business. Um, but even in college, I was always hustling. I had a carpet store and I ran the spring break trips to Florida, um, you know, paying my way through college and just kind of always just moving just is what I had to do. But after college, went to Asia, studied, studied Chinese um, primarily. So I wouldn't take a job with Procter and Gamble, like all my buddies. Um, And that sent me on a course of manufacturing and product development. Um, I ended up working for giant bicycle that at the time was not even a brand. And we, I was a small part of launching it nas- uh, nationally and internationally in the U.S. and so forth, um, which is really interesting. It's now the largest bicycle company in the world. Um, parlayed that into more sort of action sports related projects um, and sort of culminated with this ski sports, snow sports business um, where we invented a new type of snowshoe um, from the old tennis racket style to the really modern high tech one. And it was called Atlas Snowshoe Company. And I ran all the revenue for them when we were just five, six people and grew to quite quite a big company. Um, But it's akin to how I got into the cannabis space as follows. Um, We grew this company, but we really built an industry, a a category at the same time. There was no such thing as snowshoeing at big resorts and, and, um, you know, moonlight snowshoe walks and all that. So as we built Atlas, we built this infrastructure of community and, and, uh, category. And we took that company and it ultimately got sold to a publicly traded company, K2 Sports. Um, out of that, I made a little bit of, uh, um, uh, at a nice little return on, on my equity and, you know, stayed in that business, but also did a few other things, including real estate. I, I helped run a, a furniture company, again, a hard goods product that um, we made and then built and sold. Um, and I got invested, I got together in the cannabis industry with Jetty Extracts in California, where I became an investor, then an advisor, and then full-time running corporate development sales and a lot of different things. And Jetty is one of the largest brands in California. Brings us to present. Jetty invented a product called Tablicator, oil applicator, which really served the medical market. Um, and we saw a big boom in oil application, both in medical and adult use. Um, and we decided last year to spin that business out of this plant touching cannabis business. And, and that's what Ammonite is. And, and I'm running it with a small team. And we're really looking to grow this oil application category as well as our technology. Wow. So that's super yeah, that's cool. A lot. I apologize. That was, that was a bit no, of a rant. But, uh... <laughs> not at all. Super interesting. So what I'm hearing is that you've been an entrepreneur since you were in college, maybe even earlier, um, and you have a very non-traditional path, which I like to tell people, this is a non-traditional industry. So if you have a non-traditional path, that's probably good. And right. so I hear that you have been involved in bringing products to market, inventing new products, 
launching categories, basically, which, you know, in my understanding requires not only bringing a product, a new product to market, but creating awareness for consumers that, hey, this is a thing. This is something you should pay attention to. You've never heard of it. You've never tried this, but, you know, check it out. And here's why, which maybe we'll get into that a little deeper, but basically, you, you started out, uh, again, the non-traditional path as an investor in the space and then became an operator, leveraging your, your background. I'm, I'm curious, what made you make that transition or how did that transition come about with, with Jetty? Was it just to kind of protect your financial interest, the, the investment you made, or was there more to that or how, how did that happen? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really cool story. I mean, I, I touched on having done and still do real estate development. And um, I actually sold Jetty, their headquarters in their lab. So it was our building. I sold it to these kind of really scrappy, interesting guys in the cannabis business uh, five years ago. And as part of the deal is we got some equity in the company to kind of bridge the gap between um, what we wanted and what they wanted to pay. And I just became, and one of the reasons we did that is I, I really grew um, some affinity for the founder, Ron Gershoni, and, and his partners. And I said, these guys are good guys, smart guys. And I was in a position to sort of jump over and help raise money, be an advisor. It was really interesting. Um, and as I got deeper into it, and yes, it was inside of kind of taking a look and keeping an eye on our investment. Um, but as I got in, uh, you know, Ron was just like McD, they call me McD, uh, um, you know, why don't you come in and, and kind of really work hands on. Um, and I think it'd be really valuable as we grow this business, if you got some real hands on experience, you know, so running the sales department and running product development. Um, and I was like, yeah, I mean, I was in a position to do it. Um, you know, the salary opportunity was pretty meager, like a lot of this industry, um, he had to convince my wife. I'm like, Hey, I'm going to get into the weed business full time. And she's like, uh, okay. Um, so, you know, I went from really, it was a transactional on the real estate side to having shares to kind of keeping an eye on our investment to just becoming fascinated with the industry. Um, uh, you know, to, to your point, uh, and how I might, you know, utilize some of my background in in, uh, in, a con in in the way of contribution. So let me ask you how your experience in this industry or with this industry, rather, was it different from being in the bicycle world or the furniture world or, or real estate? How was it getting your hands dirty and kind of getting into the operation side of a, a budding cannabis startup? I mean, it's totally different, but a lot of the same sort of approach to the business, challenge, business challenges are the same. You know, federally illegal, we had no banking, we were flying, you know, Jet Suite X from Southern California to Northern California with duffel bags full of money. I mean, just, just insanity, no capital, um, everything was paid with cash. Um, you know, the governance and the, and the, um, and the ordinance and, and just the, the, the rules to operate as um, cannabis became adult legal in 2018. And the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars we had to spend on outfitting our lab. I mean, these are all like really incredibly interesting problems, but nothing, I mean, you know, it didn't take much to, you know, there was already an established market for bicycles, right? And a, and a roadmap on how to get there. Um, snow sports, we invented a category or helped grow a category, but you know, you sell your product at a trade show, you, you know, you pick up REI, you, you know, um, but with cannabis, it was just such the wild west. And in many respects, it still is, uh, especially as you get outside of California. What I'm doing now is, is really sort of more akin to what I did before, which is taking a product, innovating with it and scaling it nationally and internationally. But the first several years was just all about California and understanding how it works and, and, you know, the, the industry and the company, like sort of building the plane as we were flying it. Um, and I, you know, and I, I, maybe in some respects I'd done that in the past. Um, but this was, has been the most fascinating, um, component of my career in that respect. Awesome. Got it. Cool. So let's shift gears towards today and what you're working on and, and this product, the Dablicator. How did that happen and why or how did you decide to make that your focus and, and take the helm of this new business? Dablicator oil applicator was invented inside 
jetty, I think I mentioned earlier in it. It was invented in this really special way, in my opinion. It was invented uh, uh, in initially um, for a friend of the um, of the founders, Alex, who had brain cancer, and he was dealing with the after effect of treatments, chemotherapy, and so forth. No appetite, was losing weight, um, you know, nausea, pain, and so forth. So um, the Jetty founders, Ron and Nate and Rob, were, would be bringing cannabis oil to Alex, and it really helped him with his. Um, with his appetite and, and the way he could ingest it because he couldn't smoke and, um, and, and, you know, dab and so forth is he used a syringe and you, you put cannabis oil in a syringe, you're able to take it sublingually. It, it's very fast, uh, effective. Um, uh, and, and they saw it and they're like, man, this is kind of sketchy. It's not convenient. It's messy. Um, we can do, we can bring a better product to market. And, and at the same time, and, and sort of based on Alex, the experience with Alex is they started a, um, a nonprofit essentially, but inside the business called the Shelter Project. And the Shelter Project is and has become, um, you know, a, a, an organization that has donated over a million dollars for the free cannabis to cancer patients um, in California. And a large request from the cancer patients was, hey, we really need a syringe type product. And we said, well, we got something for you. Here's the applicator works way better. It's better dosing, it's cleaner, it's, it's discreet. So that was the genesis of the product, and it is inside Jetty, and it was really only a product up until recently that we sold with Jetty Extracts in. Um, it was just part of our product line, never really thought about taking it beyond Jetty. Um, and about a year ago, we got an inquiry and, and got a huge order from one of the big MSOs, Sotera in Florida, and, and, the, and their uh, sister company, Netta, in, in the Northeast, for a custom branded Dapplicator product. Um, at that point, I said, I said to myself and my partners, I'm like, this has got legs. Like, there's something really interesting about this product. And by the way, as a hard goods product inside a plant touching business, there's tons of, and you probably know this, there's really big disadvantages from a tax perspective and a governance perspective and going beyond the borders of California um, uh, because of 280E and, you know, so forth. So I said, why don't we spin this business out into a standalone company uh, focused on IP and hardware? Um, we put our CBD business over there as well. And let me let me take a run at this. Let me take this um, beyond California. Let me sort of reach out to really premium brands and MSOs and, and, and begin to enroll them in. Hey, you're already selling a lot of syringes, but consider that this category is much bigger than just medical not to mention the medical products that are being used are, are not optimized. Um, so that's what we did. And we spun it out as a platform and a, and a partnership platform, not unlike PAX, um, where you know you get on the platform, uh, you buy a turnkey solution from PAX or GEO, GPEN, and that's what we're doing. So we, we said, instead of just buying a white label, fancy looking syringe, we want to um, support you and give you a full turnkey program where you can take your exact oil that you're putting into vape or tinctures and you can put it into Dablicator and you can begin to offer your consumers, you know, five, 10, 12 brand new SKUs and really sort of attack this growing market that maybe you didn't even know was growing. Um, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, Apple is is famous for inventing stuff you didn't even know you wanted, right? Now, I don't certainly don't want to compare myself to Steve Jobs, but you know what we see in the applicator is, hey, um, you didn't even know that you needed this better mousetrap, and you didn't even know necessarily that there was this growing business in portable dabbing and and medical dabbing. Um, but it, it's growing and we've got a product line for you and new products coming out. And, you know, what do you say? And we've had a lot of success, just initial success, only launching it about three, four months ago. Very interesting. And it, it, one thing I want to say is, you know, a lot of people come to me and say, I want to get into the business and they have no idea how or what. And, you know, I tell them the, the very unsatisfying answer that, you have to actually innovate to succeed. You have to actually solve a problem. And if you don't have that off the bat, then start with something. Just get involved. And often just by stepping into the arena and being in the industry, over time, you'll discover something. And so I, I love this story because what I'm hearing from you is there is a real need 
And it was something that the Jetty team encountered in the normal course of doing business that, oh, hey, there's this other opportunity to do something better, to solve a problem. And we're hearing this not just from one person, but several people have this issue. Wait a second, can we fix this? And that's how value is created, right? And that's how innovation occurs. So I, I love that it was an organic origin <clears throat> story, if you will. And personally, I will say that I, I remember the first time I saw a syringe full of cannabis extract, and I was just like, oh, God. Nobody, like, nobody wants that. And at least that was my reaction. I'm big on challenging the stigma and normalizing and all that stuff. Nobody wants to see a syringe, let alone use one and administer anything, really, unless you're it, like it a It sort of supports person. that stereotype, right? It's sort of... Absolutely. I mean, I saw, it was funny, I kind of saw a lot of the cannabis companies on Instagram and I was cruising Instagram last night. I'm like, oh my God, there's a beauty shot from one of the big MSOs of three syringes full of oil. And I'm like, what? Like, you're trying to make syringes look sexy. I mean, um, you know, of course, that's it was my first phone call this morning <laughs> to these guys going, come on. Yeah. But yeah, you know, I mean, I have a buddy, my my buddy, Steve Cacciuti, way back high school friend. Um, he loved music. He played guitar. And he, and he said to his dad, hey, dad, I want to, I don't want to go into business right away. I want to get into, you know, I want to play music. And he said, well, Steve, if you want to be a musician, you got to be in the music business, you know, not bartending, not doing this, not doing that. And, um, you know, being in the business, and to your point, I think you're really on to, uh, I, I really agree with you. You know, you have to just jump in. And um, whether you're new to the business, I mean, I get calls all the time. Hey, you know, my, my, I, I just graduated and how do I get in the business? I'm like, well, get in the business, be a bud tender, you know, go package. We, are, we have a, you know, we have a packaging job opened at Jetty if you want to come talk to the product manager. And, um, and I, I, you know, and if you're, if you're entrepreneurial, if you're, um, you know, a hustler, you can find opportunities in what is, you know, one of the fastest growing industries on the planet. I mean, how can you go wrong if you've got, um, you know, uh, uh, integrity and, and, and go get them this, uh, uh, you can, you can do in really commitment, you can do a lot of things in this industry. Absolutely. And and if you're one of those folks listening or watching and you don't know where to start, then start by getting educated. Head on over to Amazon, pick up my book, The Cannabis Business Book. Nice. Now available in audiobook. If you like the sound of my voice, you could listen to me read the book. It's it's quite trippy with that shameless plug behind us now, Mike. I like uh, it. <laughs> I, I want to ask you if you can speak to it. You mentioned you have other products coming online. Uh, I'd be curious to hear kind of what else you guys have coming up or what's the roadmap look like. And I understand if you can't speak on it, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you a different question. Uh, inside of shameless plugs, uh, go to www.dablicator.com. And learn a lot about the product. And I think you'll dig it. And there's there's a story on the shelter project there. There's um, videos on how the product's used. And if you think about what I said earlier, we're really looking to develop a category, right? So um, I, I, I'm not interested. I've never been interested in sort of in, uh, interest, um, introducing a one-trick pony business, uh, you know, company. So presently, our Dablicator product, which has gone through multiple iterations um, and has continued to be updated, it's patented. We have more patents coming out on it specifically and it's kind of a disposable type product not a you know akin to a disposable vape but not as terrible for the environment so if you can imagine a natural iteration would be something that's reusable refillable um, but you know i sort of I, I sort of look at solving problems or negotiations or business where i'm i'm look i'm in the future looking back and i'm saying what do i want to see you know in the future and then looking back how did i get there so my goal whether it's a year from now, two years from now, is when you walk into your local cannabis distributors, there's a wall of vape. Um, there's a wall that PAX has. Um, and then there's a wall of oil, oil dispensary, you know, oil application. And there's multiple brands. Um, maybe there's some competitive products to the Dablicator line. But, you know, you can walk in and say, oh, that's cool. I can actually get a product in a, in a form factor where I can ingest cannabis. I don't have to smoke it. And I've got options from all these different brands and some of these different form factors. So, you know, it's a vague way of saying there's new products coming out. They're, they're going to be more than just disposables. Um, they're going to be more innovative and, and more consumer friendly. Um, 
so you know consider following the um the vape category if you will um that's really gone from you know interchangeable to disposable um lots of different products that require you know like live resins and rosins and some of the newer innovations in cannabis they sometimes require different um delivery apparatuses or is it apparatus um so you know i i guess you know the, the the short answer is is when you walk into um you know a true leaf or a or a rise cannabis store in in a year you're going to see a wall of oil dispensing um products and brands and um and that's our goal to make sure that it's not just a product but it's a suite of products and and brand partners got it and i want to take a step back towards the shelter project i just want to on honor you guys for doing that for donating I, I think you said over a million dollars worth of cannabis to cancer patients in California and I, I think first of all that's phenomenal second of all I want to say you know I'm a big proponent that anyone who's in this industry has to do some form of community reinvestment and giving back and it should be part of your business model from day one right. and I also want to say that I've heard stories of cannabis businesses and and cannabis entrepreneurs who wanted to donate, whether it's just to charity or donate product or whatever, where charities and nonprofits and whatever are still saying no to accepting cannabis money because they view it as unsavory. And it's really mind boggling to me, but I, I just want the, the viewers to know that that's still a thing and that stigma is still very real. And I think it's super important that businesses and the community continue to do it anyway. And right. if, if the nonprofit doesn't want to take your money, start a nonprofit. There will be someone who's, who's going to be willing to commit to, to running it, to growing it, to managing it, whatever, because there are so many people in this community that really care about helping yeah. others. Well, I appreciate your acknowledging, you know, that both with Jetty and, and generally in the industry. And, and in fairness, I didn't start the, the shelter pro, uh, project, um, but it was one of the reasons I really felt an, a, a kinship to this, this team that did. If you can appreciate in 2013, 2014, which that's when Jetty was founded, they didn't have two nickels to rub together. They were growing a business. And so, of course, it made sense to set up a separate business that didn't bring in revenue, but in fact spent money. To right, I mean, it's kind of crazy, but that's who that's who the founders of, you know, um, like Lindsey Friedman and Nate Ferguson uh, and Rob Ron Cursoni and Rob Ferguson. I mean, that that's what they stood for. They really wanted to bring cannabis to consumers in a in a way that was um, authentic and and generous. Um, and 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 so shelter project started uh, like that. And back before 2018, we could mail cannabis, medical cannabis, in the U.S. Postal Service. In theory, I'm not sure you really could, but it wasn't a big deal. Uh, there weren't the regulations on on tracking inventory like there started to be in 2018. And as I mentioned, I'd, we had given over a million dollars worth of cannabis to pa cancer patients, and they went through a reasonably rigorous sign up process with the doctors verification but essentially you know if you were if you made it into the program you'd get you know 10 20 30 grams of different types of cannabis products in your in your mailbox every month um, you know fast forward to 2018 uh, adult legalization in California that became almost impossible to do almost overnight just because of the regulatory con considerations around tracking inventory and so forth but little by little over the last several years and in conjunction with several California brands that we're buddies with. We lobbied the California state government for a compassion law that has now allowed that sort of contribution of actual product to start happening again. It's a little more rigorous, it's a little more onerous, but we're doing it again, as are some other brands in their own way. Um, you know, from a stigma perspective, are you, where are you based, Mike? I'm in New York. Okay, so California, the stigma is very, is much different. It's, it's sort of the most developed market out here. It's as if it's a, I mean, it's a full CPG business where there's competition and brands and 
you know, very much like a normal business, with the exception of the fact there aren't enough retail stores in California, which make it difficult to run a business if you're on the supplier side. Um, but you're right. I mean, until recently, uh, that stigma is there. It's 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 falling away more and more. Um, and investment in community is a big part of what we're up to. Social equity is a huge component to the industry right now, as I know you're aware. You know the um, uh, uh, community of Black and Brown um, folks have been taking the lion's share of the of the um, penalties for being involved with the business, and the, you know the last prisoner project and and legislation that's really focused on giving minorities an opportunity to participate in this in this groundswell of uh, opportunity. Uh, Jetty has sponsored and is partner now with a um, minority started and owned brand called Oakland Extracts, for example. Um, we're helping it grow, we're giving it seed capital, we're putting it through our distribution channels. Um, we uh, incubate it uh, through the social equity plan in Oakland where we brought in a minority owned business to help them get started. So. It's very much part of the ethos of, I would say, the the authentic cannabis companies, um, and it's becoming a requirement, even if you're not necessarily authentic, just from a ordinance perspective. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I think it's it's what's incrementally pretty awesome about the industry. Yeah, great. And I, I want to highlight one thing I heard, which is something that I'm constantly pounding the table on for entrepreneurs in this space, which is, first of all, activism is mandatory. And second of all, even once a state goes legal, for example, California in 2018 with adult use, that doesn't mean that the activism is over and, and done with. There's still often plenty of work to do to adjust restrictive regulations or to make the program more equitable or to increase access to patients. And, you know, it's like, it's so easy to read the headlines and think, oh, okay, this is over. We won kind of thing. And in reality, that's just not the case. There's still so much work to do, whether you're in a legal state or a state that's, you know, just coming on board or a medical state, there's often still a ton of advocacy that needs to happen so that there's greater access and protection for people who need it most, which are, in my judgment, are the medical patients and the folks that have been disproportionately harmed by prohibition. Mike, I want to ask you a, a little higher level question, uh, which is, what advice do you have for investors or entrepreneurs who are looking to get into the space well, I, I think from an investor perspective, and we're seeing the return of the capital markets. I mean, it was sort of a dot-com bubble thing a few years ago, ridiculous valuations, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars pouring in primarily from um, publicly traded and publicly launched companies in Canada. Um, and as well as, you know, investors that were putting pools of money together to invest in early startups. I think what you're seeing now is a much more normalized business model. Um, you know, for example, a couple of years ago, Jetty was focused on grow, 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 grow at any expense, you know, burning cash, grow, get market share such that we're, um, you know, an attractive candidate to collapse with some other businesses to become a part of something larger. Um, and when the cannabis investment bubble kind of um, popped in 2018, 2019, um, we saw it coming. I'd like to think we were a little bit ahead of the curve and we said, you know what, this grow at any cost is crazy. Let's run a sustainable business. Like, you know, businesses that, you know, don't, you know, are burning cash and, you know, growing, 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 it's just not sustainable. And, and so we switched gears and looked at profitability, slowing our growth to the extent we needed to, getting rid of accounts that didn't want to pay us. Um, cutting back on overhead so we could really be this more sustainable business to our investors and our employees. Um, so from an investor perspective, I think you want to look at companies that are real companies, that, you know, there's a real there there, um, companies run by real operators and not necessarily financial engineers. Um, and we're seeing a flight of capital towards that type of uh, investment. Um, if you take a look at some of the better MSOs, multi-state operators out there, you know, the GTIs, the True Leaves, um, 
the Crescos and so forth. I mean, they're running real businesses. Um, they're very capital intensive because they're building up brick and mortar in every single state and full vertical. But I think you're going to have a handful of winners on the national level. Um, so investment there, I think, is smart. Um, some of the folks at those companies that I mentioned have really, really um, excellent leadership. Um, and uh, and then, you know, if you're if you're getting a little more granular, if you're looking to sort of invest in something that could pop down the road, like an investment in Jetty, an investment in Canacraft, an investment in Plus, which are you know brands that are mostly focused in California, the largest cannabis uh, market on the planet bigger than Canada itself as a state. Um, again, you're gonna wanna look for and I recommend looking for real operators, people that know how to run a business from cultivation to, to delivery and retail. Um, not the fancy, shiny, um, sexy sort of branding. Um, so that's from an investor perspective. And then um, I apologize, the second part of your question was- For um, operators or entrepreneurs who wanna get into the business. So um, advice, yeah, I mean, I think, I think we touched on it earlier, um, get into the business. If you want to be in the cannabis business, you got to be in the cannabis business, not on the sidelines. Um, it's kind of, you know, I was running a company, I was president of a $20 million concrete furniture company um, when we sold our building to, um, to Jetty. It actually was our old headquarters. And I said to my partner, hey, I really, you know, I've kind of helped you get this concrete uh, business up and going, furniture business up and going. I think I'm going to pivot. And uh, he's best, one of my best friends um, that started the, the furniture company. And he said, do it. And so, because I knew I wanted to get in the business, but I, did, I was sitting on the sidelines as an investor, kind of an advisor. And um, I just jumped in. And, and so, you know, not everybody can afford to leave their day job and, you know, jump into cannabis. But I think um, the opportunities are there. Skill sets that are um, have been developed in the consumer products industry retail business, manufacturing of other products are very much transferable to this industry, especially as it normalizes and needs to become a real business. You know, finance, accounting, sales, marketing, operations. Um, you know, if you want to be in this business, there's no shortage of opportunities. And frankly, now that it's developed, there's not even a, um, you know, you're not going to have to give up a real paycheck because of the growth of the business and the uh, and the demand for talent, so you know, get intentional, um, decide why you want to shift into this industry, and then you know, I, I say um, that the best man or woman for the job is the best one who can get the job. <laughs> so you know, may not be the most talented, the most uh, you know, highly skilled, but if you can get the job, you got the job. So um, you know, having having a hustle. Uh, 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 you know, having hustle as part of your ethos is is going to be good in any industry, and and specifically in this fast-growing, really interesting cannabis industry. Yeah, definitely. So, Mike, before we shift into the coaching portion of the conversation today, I wanted to ask you if there's anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to speak about, or any other thoughts that you want to share with the audience before we shift gears. Um, I, you know, we touched on a lot of things and I sort of, before we even got on air, I talked a little bit more about this category development. And that's what I think is really interesting and fun. In any business, if you bring value to your customer, um, that's that's the goal, right? Like if you're being of value, uh, instead of trying to sell them something or trying to sort of win something. Um, so I'd like, you know, I welcome competition in this category that we're building because it's just going to build the category more. Um, so, you know, I just think sort of personally, what's exciting for me is, you know, being blessed at this opportunity to kind of really grow something, um, build a small team again. I like building things. I like kind of starting small and building big, um, but also having this sort of sister relationship with one of the most respected group of people that I've met in my career. Um, so I guess I'll just leave you with um, what's fun about what I'm doing and what my team is doing is, is building this category and then being of service to our customers by bringing them new and unique products. And it's pretty cool. It feels pretty good when I can deliver overnight to um, you know somebody like uh, Ancient Roots in Ohio, a brand new brand that's on our platform. And I can say, um, you know, David, here, here's a product and overnight you've got now 10 different SKUs and a differentiator for your customers. 
and he's stoked, right? Um, and it's not about, well, it costs this and it costs that. And it's just like, let's do this for partners. And that's how I like building building my business and how I've sort of been successful, I'd like to think, um, in my career. So um, now this is a great interview. I think you touched on, you know, really, really some important components about what's going on in this industry. So thank you. Oh, thank you. And it sounds like you're having fun and I'm having fun too, because I, I get to yeah. share stories of entrepreneurs in cannabis and, and document that, which I think you'll probably agree that, you know, this is a once in a lifetime industry or this this point in time seeing things come online and being able to build in this industry while it's still nascent and in, very much entrepreneurial I, I think is something that you know we'll all look back on one day and say wow like what what a what a gift to be able to be a part of that yeah so it's my pleasure to to be able to chat with you and share your story and now I'm going to put on my coaching hat and ask Mike. you, <laughs> Mike, what is your biggest business buzzkill or challenge today? Yeah, we chatted about that before we went on air. And it's funny because I was thinking about this last night and, and you know, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's basic, right? Um, especially when you've got a, when you've got a business that you're really resource light and, you know, like with a larger industry, it's like, you, you know, HR and, you know, hiring the right people and making sure it's the right fit and running a really, you know, tight ship, if you will. That's like when I've run larger businesses, that's always been the challenge and, and breaking through barriers and so forth. But with a small startup, especially with COVID, a small startup that I'm essentially running from home with a, a freshman and a senior in high school that are in, you know, California, you're not in school. I mean, they're, they're homeschooling. And I went from Going, going to work every day and coming home, um, and my wife works also, um, to I, I'm making breakfast, I'm making lunch, I'm making dinner, unless I'm on a podcast, and then they're knocking on the door. I actually put an on-air sign outside the door um, to let them awesome. know. It's kind of funny. Um, you know, but the printer is in my studio, and sometimes they need algebra papers, right? So, so what it's caused me, and I noticed recently, it's, it's becoming stressful to really separate um, between, you know, family and business, even if we weren't operating from home, because when you're doing a startup, it's, it's go, 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 it's 24 seven. And, and that's sort of generally the nature of entrepreneurs. So that's always been a little bit of a challenge, but when you're able to go away to work and come home, that can be a little easier. Um, so catching myself on my phone at dinner, I'm like, what am I doing? You know, that's, that's not cool. I mean, I have this precious time with my family, especially my kids, you're going to be go on in a couple of years. So I guess, you know, in summary, that sort of um, healthy divide between family and work um, has been an ongoing, has always been an, an issue and a challenge, but even more so now with this insane sort of world we're living in. Um, so that's, that was, that will, that's what came up for me when, when we chatted a little bit about that coaching. So what do you say, coach? Well, first I will say I can totally relate. And I feel like most people are experiencing some version of what you're going through. And so what I'm hearing is this divide or separation of work life and family life and managing that in a good way during this COVID environment. And so my question back to you is, what, you know, I, I'm hearing that you want to be able to do this a little better or better. And my question is, what's it costing you right now to do things the way that you're doing them? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to, to sort of put it back to me. I mean, I think, you know, I try not to live in the world of better in some respects. And I, I what I mean by that is, um, I, I, you know, consider that everything we're doing, everything I'm doing is perfect. It's exactly the way it's supposed to be, right? Because I think when you get into this right and wrong thing, you kind of start to beat yourself up. So, so by the way, reminding myself that that's true is, is a part of this process. And it's great that we're even talking about this, right? So yeah, I mean, what's it costing me? And, and it, you know, it's costing me you know, it's costing me relationships. It's costing me um, in, in theory, right? Like if, if this doesn't, 
if the, if the, if I don't take this on, it could cost me, you know, a, a more a, a fuller relationship with my my daughter who's going to be out of the house in six months, right? This is a really special time that's really stressful for her, right? Can you imagine living your senior year um, from your freaking bedroom? Um, and then my freshman daughter, I mean, you can imagine not being on campus, like that's your whole dream to be a freshman and your older sister is high-fiving you with her girlfriends in the in the hallway, right? Like this was supposed to be this really special time for them. And it's this weird kind of shitty thing that's, you know, so being available to them is important. And if I'm distracted by my business, um, A, I'm not as available to them as I might be. And B, you know, like what 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 impression is that leaving with them about their their importance to me? And then the flip side of that is my ability to be focused on my business. I did, you know, I, I, I bought an exercise bicycle, which was a component to really staying healthy in this environment. And I, and I try to get on it almost every day. Um, and that's something that's really helped me sort of clear my mind. But um, yeah, and what it's costing me is relationship, right? And, and, and it's costing me relationship in, relationships inside a time that's, that's finite. Um, you know, I'm not going to have this opportunity again. Um, with my 17 soon to be 18 year old or my, you know, 15 year old. And, um, you know, when you get into it, that's, that's kind of sad. Um, so I'm committed to it, but it is a constant sort of reminder and that's where coaching comes in and, and, um, you know, having, having someone like yourself ask these questions, um, rather than just being in, in my head about them. Right. Yeah. So I, I want to go a little, deeper for further if that's okay with you which is i want to ask you in, in your best sense of you know being of service or support what how can you offer that for your daughters at this time well in in fact i'm in one respect covid's been really amazing and i i get that I and a lot of my colleagues, yourself, for example, we're fortunate enough to be able to work from home, right? Like we're not out of work. Um, my wife's a dentist and she had to shut her practice down for three months. Seven employees, you know, had to go on unemployment. Um, so, and, and what I mean by that, A, the, the unfortunate is I, I recognize um, how fortunate I am. And, but B, it's really giving me this really cool different opportunity to connect with my kids, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, um, stress, hey, dad, blah, 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 you know, clean your damn dishes up, you know, kind of that sort of very hands-on parenting that, um, you know, we didn't have when I'm gone for 10 hours a day. Um, but, uh, you know, the opportunity is to um, really be present to what they've going on which because i'm here all the time and not just seeing them for an hour in the, you know in the morning and an hour at night um it's really given me access to um who they are as people and if and reminding myself of that is the challenge rather than being pissed off that um when i make this really great dinner they're like eh. i'm like i find myself going you don't appreciate i'm like all right relax they're they're teenagers they're stress they're not having the right experience they were hoping and oh by the way they're teenagers um so you know this this experience has been really cool uh, you know and stressful um but i think that's but that's the opportunity it's a really special time in their lives and i'm getting to sort of participate at a deeper level than i might otherwise which has got its pros and cons because then i got a deal with the you know, punk ass teenagers that um, don't appreciate anything and da 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 da. Um, so I, I'm not, I, I, I apologize, I might've gone off script a little bit, but um, it's, this, it's this amazing and challenging um, um, uh, uh, relationship opportunity and, and sort of bringing it full circle, it requires, it requires commitment and focus. And when I'm on my phone and, you know, I don't shut it off and it's, dinner time and I just have to send this this one last email um, I'm sort of robbing myself and them and, and my wife by the way we don't really talk about my what my relationship is in my marriage which is really great too but um, I think it's incrementally uh, in, more important 
to to really, especially when you're working at home and you have these, you know, this sort of these stressors built in, to to figure out a way to put some structure in this separation of of business and family, because of what's at stake and what's what's available. Um, you know, if if I'm more successful at, at at bringing that forward. So I'm hearing. I'm going to paraphrase a bit, but I'm hearing that you you have this opportunity right now, this unique opportunity to, to be there with your family and the stakes there are higher than maybe you recognize regularly. I'm, I'm going to offer you this as just a crazy idea, which is one, I wonder if you've expressed kind of what you shared with me, if you've expressed that to your daughters I'm just curious and you don't have to answer. I'm just putting that out there in in case that might be interesting for you. And then two, I I heard you say some variation of the word reminder or to, you know, to remind yourself of this and to have the structure. So I'm wondering, is there a way that you can build a reminder into your routine that, you know, this current pandemic routine to, to maintain that perspective of, Hey, I have this opportunity here and I'm enjoying it. And they're teenagers and, you know, all all the kind of stuff that you shared with me. And then my last question will be, what, if anything, do you intend to do differently going forward? Number, number three is, I think, going to reference what structure, because I, because I think, um, uh, you know, what, what could be done differently is, is really, you know, how do you put structure uh, around something? Because we all know that if there's structure, if it's if it's calendared, if it's, you know, uh, organized, it's got a much higher um, potential to be successful. But I want to go back to your first question, and it, it's really interesting. I, I I I haven't had this that specific conversation with my family, you know, my kids, and even with my wife to the extent of it's more like. Hey, what's it like for you to be in a relationship with me? Um, you know, not like, well, what do you think about this? I'm like, you know, I, I was thinking, uh, I was talking to my buddy Mike, Mike Z, and um, it occurred to me that being in a relationship with me might be kind of, you know, stressful or or this or that, and. And, um, you know, I wanted to get your perspective on that. And I have a feeling I know what they would say, and it's probably not all that kind. Um, but who knows? You know, they might be like, yeah, it's kind of a bummer to have you on your phone and not be available to us. I think getting present to what it's like for people to be in a relationship with you and asking that question um, is can be a really powerful thing. Um, so I'm going to do that. Um, and I'll have to find the right time with teenagers. <laughs> Because <laughs> of it, you know, when when they're not watching Gossip Girl for the seventh time, um, <laughs> um, in between classes, um, and you know, frankly, it's it's a it, it's a healthy consideration with my wife. I mean, we're married 21 years, and um, we're awesome. But you know, you can you know sometimes you forget about uh, about that um, those kinds of considerations. And then, what can I do differently? Well, I, I'm going to have that conversation those conversations so that's different um and then i have been thinking like you know even with my exercise like i kind of do it now when i can but then i go three four days in a row where i'm like shit you know i haven't gotten on my bike in a while well how did four days go by so you know i have been considering blocking out time for that blocking out time for for my business and then 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 considering it's even more important to block out that time for my family um so you know, that's in response to the, what, what I would do, what I will do um, differently going forward. Awesome. I love that. And I'm going to steal your question. I'm going to use that in my life with uh, what's it like to be in relationship with me? I think that's a fantastic question. And I encourage anyone and everyone who's listening to this, ask the people you're close with that question and open the door to that conversation and I can't imagine that it won't strengthen those relationships. So I, I think that's a phenomenal question. Thank you for that, Mike. Well, I, I would say just as an adjunct to that, um, you know, what's it like to be in a relationship with me? And ask that with any expect with no expectations. 
and ask that with real wide open uh, ears. And, and as you begin to tell me what it's like to be in a relationship with me, you know, uh, uh, what I found is, yeah, and then what else? And okay, that's okay, and what else? And you know, <laughs> you'd be surprised. And what's interesting, what can come out initially is the things that piss them off about being in a relationship with you. But as, as I've, when I've done this in the past, um, you begin to kind of get what's also great about being in a relationship with you. And it can change the perspective to your point of that, of that relationship. So yeah, I want to hear more about it. And, and I'm inspired just in this conversation to, to do it more. Um, Cause when I've been really sort of powerful in my relationships, um, I was doing that kind of stuff. So thank you for that reminder. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. Thank you. And I, I got to just respond quickly with a little joke. I think I'm reminded of uh, one of my favorite Ali G skits from back in the day where he's like talking to, I feel like it was like a former DEA agent and he asks about marijuana and all of the, the side effects and you know, the, the officer says like this whole list of things and he just responds and he's like, and what are the bad ones? <laughs> so I, I feel like it's like the, the reverse in this situation of, you know, what's it like being in a relationship with me? And it's like, yeah, they, they talk and talk. And what are the good ones? So I, I, I want to add that caveat to, to Mike's point, which is maybe in the instructions offer, hey, you'll have a minute to tell me the, the bad stuff and then a minute to tell me the good stuff, you know? So it's a little balanced and and totally echo the point of, open listen with open ears and an open heart and don't take it personally but pay attention because if you trust someone enough to ask that question and to listen to what they have to say if you actually value their opinion and care and they care enough to be honest and give you that feedback it's probably something that you're going to want to hear it might not be pleasant in the short term but in the long term, they'll probably be good for you. Yeah, you're right. Awesome. Mike, this has been fun. I'm going to let you off the hot seat here. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate you being willing to open up and share some of that stuff and be able to, to as we say, dance in the coaching sense of the, the word. Oh, oh wait, I, speaking of which, I have to say the and what else in coaching school, that's like the second question they teach you because- that works for just about anything is just asking and what else and what else and and following up with that so i, I love that yeah. you went there for the aspiring coaches listening you know that's a put that in your in your toolbox because you're going to need that all the time it's it's am, yeah. amazing how, how how well that works so yeah. anyway mike thank you so much for joining me it's been a pleasure chatting with you and i want to salute you and the work you're doing and i i can't wait to to see dablicators all over New York City once the dispensaries here are actually worth going to. <laughs> oh, well, thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me on and stay safe in New York City, man. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. The cannabis business coach. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. The cannabis business coach.